I am resident of the Hollywood for YouTube, Jewel Saints. It's my buddy Gordon Dabowski. It's my buddy Patrick from McCray. We're here to talk Dark Shadows episode 915, baby. Uh, narrated by Marie Wallace, written by Gordon Russell, directed by Henry Kaplan. Uh, this episode was recorded December 24th on Christmas Eve, 1969. It was broadcast December 29th, 1969. Uh, Gordon, you picked this episode, buddy. It's a Leviathan episode, so why'd you pick it? Um, because I think it's full of the warmth and cheer of the holiday. Um, <laughs> no, um, yes. no, but it, it actually came from a couple of conversations we've had on, on this show. Um, like when we talked about 887, um, you know, Jewel, you were wondering how Barnabas knew that the thought that the Barnabas might have known Oberon because he said, you, where are you? Um, and, uh, and 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 there are also conversations we've had kind of about like where where the plot was going in certain storylines. And this is this is a very um, if if you watch it within the context of the show, it doesn't look like any it looks like every other um, episode. You know, you don't really think of it in terms of being special. But this episode was written because uh, the feedback that the producers were getting from the fans was, why, what, why is, what, you know, what, what, why is Barnabas evil now? Um, what's going on? Uh, we can't follow this. So this is uh, colloquially known as the Leviathan reboot episode, where I think. I think many fans think of this as a way that they were kind of rewriting the story. I kind of, in watching it, I think what they were trying to do is just clarify some things so people knew what was going on. And it still works as an episode, but I think it's one of those where it's easy to see Dark Shadows as this big, like Dan Curtis had this five-year plan starting with the introduction of, of Victoria Winters and ending with 1841 Parallel Time. But a lot of times we're making this stuff up as it goes along. And I think this episode does a couple of things really well. It it kind of establishes like, okay, who are the Leviathans? And what exactly are they? Um, but it also changes Barnabas's role from being um, kind of the, the, the antagonist to uh, the reluctant hero slash pawn of the antagonists. And I don't really think there's a hero quote unquote in the in the Leviathan storyline until late in, but I think this is one of those where it's a transitional episode, um, like two seventy six rather than a big revelation episode. But I wanted to bring the this up mostly because I I I figured it'd be good to talk about how sometimes the transitional episodes help clarify things and help kind of turn the story in a different direction. Yes. And I don't want to get away from that, but you said something really interesting that I want to get back to at some point. And it's that there, there, it takes a while for there to be heroes in the storyline. Mm -hmm. it, it could be right. I never thought of it that way. But I, I know that's not what we're talking about right now, though. So just, just you know, to mm -hmm. bookmark that. Uh, wow. What do, you, what, what do you think, Joel? Um. No, hold on. Um, I think that with this episode, first of all, I do agree with you that they're sort of reworking the Leviathan arc here, but they also set this up with prior episodes where Barnabas is talking to Julia Hoffman, and you could tell that Barnabas is sort of, before this episode, having sort of somewhat second thoughts, like, do I really want to work for these people? And then this episode here is both a fun and be weird. It's it's a good weird though. It's not a bad weird because you have the moment in the uh, antique shop with Michael, um, who's telling Barnabas, "Hey, that Julia Hoffman, yeah, she she's got to go. And by go, I mean dead. Uh, her eyes got to close and permanently." And I love the line that he says, <laughs> or the way he says it. Her this, eyes are always open. This this kid 
has been, ever since the character's been introduced, has <clears throat> slowly but surely taking, ta taken over as your main uh, antagonist. I mean, he makes Barnabas look like a sweetheart at this point. <laughs> and it's like, Jesus. But I love that. I love the fact that they're, they're taking a kid. And we haven't seen a kid this sort of heavy since David. Since the way David well, I, was I in think, the I think fat, fat shaming is a bit <laughs> You know, a heavy is a heel. You know what I mean. Baby face yeah. heel. If I have to get into, I don't want to get into the wrestling terminology too much. Neither do we. Neither do we. I'm trying to save that here. Um, but with this episode, they do a really good job. They've done a really good job with these Leviathan episodes of making this kid the heel. And so really, mm -hmm. he's, he's somewhat... They're sort of the writers are sort of passing the torch a bit with okay, Barnabas isn't going to be our heel much, much longer because we're going to turn him back, baby, you know, baby face. Sorry for the wrestling analogy, but that's what they're going to do. We're here. And here in this episode, you see it a little bit more where you have the Leviathan, Barnabas summons the Leviathans, he sits on the couch and he falls asleep. And what the Leviathans are doing, they're showing them. We're also seeing some more Leviathan power in this episode, too, which is really cool. We're showing, hey, if you don't do what we do, not only will we turn you back into what you were, which is a vampire, because I love the dream sequence I do down at the docks, and but we will forever keep Josette's ghost prisoner. We, we, we took you. Who do you think took her? Then they're meaning Josette. They show Josette's portrait. And the fact that you're getting implications finally in this arc i mean it's not like they they didn't wait too terribly long to do this but they did make the audience wait and look dark shadows is all always about making us wait for that big moment and i don't want to say this is the biggest moment but it is a big it is a pretty significant moment in the leviathan arc to let us know what the stakes are well it's also a pen it's a penultimate josette moment because it's it's just a little while after this that she finally says, Barnabas, it's okay, get over it. It's all right, yeah. it's time. But this is, I think, her second to last uh, appearance before that happens. Am I wrong on that? No, I, she doesn't. She's going to make an appear. I believe an appearance after this one, and it, she's going to tell Barnabas, "Hey, they don't have my ghost." And I think that's yeah, it's. The well, next time we see, we see Josette, well, the next time we see Josette isn't as a ghost, I believe it's in the parallel 1841 parallel time. Um, well, now there's one more where she, the, she's yeah, she says something okay. like, Hey, it's before they they bring in Roxy and Drew, right? And and it's like, Oh, you can, you, you, I, I'm pretty certain because Barnabas says, Oh, the ring I can give back, or something like that, and I still have the receipt. Um, uh yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Joseph. Yeah. Um what, what are you gonna do? You know? Um I had some observation that was worth it. And uh that was in nineteen eighty two. But since then, this is what you got. Yeah. Well let me ask you guys this about this he episode. Agreed. What did you what did you guys think about them sort of working up to this moment to okay, we have to explain why Barnabas is the way he is right here and they do it? What do you, did you guys think of that? Um I know what I'm supposed to say. And what I'm supposed to say is that this is a bold storytelling move for them to take Barnabas and put him over here. And that they betrayed the essence of the risk taking that they could have and um i guess in the words of jeffrey lebowski that's like you know your opinion man but the fact is is that there are bold storytelling moves and then there's giving me what i come to the franchise for and you can put boba in my tap water and that's a bold high you know hydraulics move but that's not why i turn on the tap water and uh, and I I go to Dark Shadows for certain reasons, and and following Barnabas is one of them. 
and and following Barnabas, who has a slow, mostly plateauing, but occasionally ascending moral arc, is one of them. And so, yeah, they made an error. And I was glad they fixed it. Uh, when I first saw it, I wasn't quite aware of that. I, you know, I didn't know it was an emergency episode or anything. And it's kind of, in some ways, it's better to not know. Because if you are, if you're just at one with the shadows, it's it's just this lovely twist. It's like, huh, what do you know? Now, if you're looking at it literarily, it's like bringing back Chewbacca. You know, it's like, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, it's kind of lame. But uh, but I happen to like bringing back Chewbacca. Maybe Chewbacca doesn't always need to die. Maybe Barnabas doesn't always need to be the bad guy. And and I felt like there was a, a, a it's a wonderful this was December twenty fourth because it is a gift to viewers. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. Gordon, yeah, I, I think this was kind of a uh, I think and and I'm probably going to be a little bit harsher than than maybe expected, but I think this episode was a was necessary because. We've talked before about how um, the Leviathan storyline, when it kicks off, it's, um, you know, it's it's really not what we were told it was going to be. You know, conventional fan wisdom was it's Lovecraft, but it's not really Lovecraft. It's more of a paranoid, um, more of a par you know, more of a paranoid, you know, invasion of the body snatchers type of story. Um, and it's one where there's no real clear with the original 56 movie you had kevin mccarthy as the guy saying this is happening with the um with the the, the later remake it would be donald uh, uh donald sutherland um but here there's no real maybe julia's the one seeing what's going on there's but there's really no clear identical good guy in in a traditional sense uh, uh at the time Barnabas would have been okay while he's being made the, he's immediately made the tool to bring this, this, you know, thing over. Cause let's remember, Michael is not a human boy. He no. is some kind of weird creature. No. Um, it, it's Barnabas like would have hero. realized, Hey, they played me and he'd be the obvious uh, protagonist against the Leviathans. But I think they kind of got into a little bit of a bind because it's like, you know, maybe the ex the ratings were were suffering and they were getting nasty fan mail but at some point you need to establish well one who are these people these leviathans what is their power and more importantly who how do you get barnabas if not back on the track of you could still have him be part of the antagonist he can still be the bad guy but how do you get him back to where the audience is like on his side yeah. yeah, I think, you know, if, if we're going to get into the kind of the, the politics of the construction of all of this, which I think is 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 important to it. It's curious to, to try to figure out what conversations were happening. when. So at this time, they were gearing up to do House of Dark Shadows. And it could be around this time that Fred was probably making it no secret that he did not want to you know, become like Christopher Lee in, you know, adoration and super success. No, he didn't want to become like Christopher Lee and just, you know, every movie, you know, the monk comes along, a little desiccated Dracula blood and, you know, puts it in the soda stream and out he comes. Um, so, you know, once was enough, Dan. Once once is enough. I kind of, I, I suspect maybe those conversations were happening around the water cooler pretty early. And who knows, you know, how expensive Jonathan's contract was getting and so on and so forth. So what I'm looking at is a story where we have a way to make Barnabas a bad guy again. To have him allied with a larger force. So not only is he a bad guy, he's bringing his buddies the Leviathans. Yeah. And then who comes along to be a hero? Quentin. Yeah. And so we have a reason to have Quentin versus Barnabas. Yeah. 
with this unstable element in between Quentin 2.0, which is Jeb. And, you know, maybe this becomes about Quentin and Jeb sitting in a tree. Uh, but, but you know, they can keep Barnabas around or if Jonathan gets too expensive, bye-bye. And uh, because they have their hottie, they have the hotter hottie, David Selby. And, um, and I think probably when this was first discussed, some of that, if not all of that, was on the table. But, you know, they get to, you know what if somebody gave a Quentin and nobody, nobody, nobody attended? Um, and much less came. And, and I think that's the situation because you've got all of these heroes, all of these, even Roger gets into the hero business. Once they decide to start having heroes, you got Roger too, but they're kind of all treating fighting the Leviathans like sort of a hobby, Mm -hmm. you know, fighting Patofi was a full-time job and fighting. And he only had one man working with him and that was Beth. Uh, so, uh, but, but fighting the Leviathans, it's like, well, it's Tuesday. Oh, let's check in and see what Jeb's doing. Uh, I'll go down to the antique store and punch him. It's fine. He's probably trying to rape Carolyn. No. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Well, he does, like, intoxicate her and attempt to, I think, probably physically have his way with her. It's it's one of the most disturbing things in Dark Shadows that doesn't happen, but it's yeah, you know, mm-hmm. Jesus. One of my favorite Leviathan episodes is when Angelique tells Barnabas about the Leviathan, and I mean that to me was good too. I mean, there, I don't think this arc is awful. You know what I mean? But I, I don't think so. yeah, I don't think it's awful either. You know what I, I mean? I, yeah, I think that the biggest issue with this arc, if I had to put it there, and, and it's it's not something you have any control with, is how do you follow up 1897 yeah. in a in a satisfactory way? And I think this is where the writers, you know, swung for the fences and maybe instead of a home run they hit a triple. But they still but they still they still shoot shot, you know, they still took their shot. I don't want to play Monday morning quarterback. I I asked you guys in the prior episode that we did, what would you have liked to have seen instead of this? I know we were getting a movie and the discussions for that movie were probably going on about this time. But what I would have loved to see is instead of a movie, expand your television universe for Dark Shadows. Don't just keep it in Collinsport. Take it have Barnabas and Julia leave Collins Court or have people of the Collins family leave Collins Court. And again, I, one of my favorite stories is cat people get into that because well, that would have been a they, neat they story. Could, the Collinses could quit their jobs in a brewery and move to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could have did that. Lenny and Squiggy show up. You could have did that, yeah. But I do like this art for the most part. It's a unique story. It's fascinating. The one, I love how in this episode you get Marie Wallace coming in on that dream sequence too, where she just enters and Barnabas is staring at her neck. There's great camera work by by the director and the production. They do a really good job of the Leviathan explaining themselves and who they are, as mm-hmm. Gordon pointed out. But what I really love too is when Barnabas realizes this this whole sequence was shown to him by the Leviathan and how p- powerful they really are. So now he knows how formidable they are. I think the biggest the biggest mistake they make here in, in this arc is they they decide who what's their weakness. And when you get into weaknesses, you want more, for a supervillain, you want at least one. You get more than one, you have a problem. Because if they're if they're less if it's more than one, how strong can they really be? And once they decide on the werewolf is going to be the Leviathan's weakness, great, that's unique as hell. Okay, now you're going to have a role for Chris Jennings to do, you know, Don Briscoe's character. Because I don't understand why am I fighting this thing? I just want to build a gas station. 
<laughs> I think that was, you know, I got a sketches cool for a mini mark. <laughs> I think that's a neat idea to have a werewolf be your weakness. That's cool. But then it goes from that to all oh, their 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 weakness is the supernatural, the ghost. It's like, wait, wait a second, time out. <laughs> Pull that back. Yeah, a bit. Some some all powerful primordial race they turned out to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's sort of what when they get away from the werewolf, that's sort of what hurts this arc a bit. I do love a lot of the acting we get because there's there's great psychology in this. The breathing, I love. I've talked about that, how when they're shooting the scenes with Maggie Evans going through the great house looking for the kids and you hear that sinister breathing, that was sick. I love Jewel, that. You, you, you love that breathing so much, you have frequently called me and just breathed like that into the phone. Yeah, he's exactly. done that to me too, Patrick. It's, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to. Explain it's over fast. I'm just yeah. trying to show you guys what I do with Julie. Um, no, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, There's something weird about it. Now you're calling your wife up at work and with a phone call. Well, oh, well if, I, if, I can, if I can, if I can, if I can jump in, I, yeah. I don't think the main problem with the Leviathan arc is is that there's too many weaknesses because i think that was just the writers trying to figure out i think it's something that you really i i think it's i think a lot of it was just that you could see the it was the timing and it's something that couldn't be helped because yeah. this came along in that kind of late 60 late 69 early 70 when the country was becoming more paranoid and more insular and because you had altamont and, and you started you know kent state was about to happen if it hadn't happened already so it's a much darker storyline and i could see someone turning on dark shadows you know to turn on three months ago everything is fun and it's old timey and it's it's quentin and and it's you know it's it's still got it's the like same going dark to, it's like going to ferals right and now you're watching it and it's like, you know, the world is a the world is a is an existential garbage fire. Why am I watching this right now? I mean, the only the only the only other worst timing I could think of is if you decided to watch um if you decided to start this arc on March fifteenth, twenty twenty, just as the pandemic was was, you know, just as lockdown was starting to happen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think yeah. it's anything wrong with the like we can nitpick the writing and everything else, but I think mm -hmm. because of the the timing of it, I, it just a lot of people were just like, "Why am I watching this?" You're, you're not too you're not too too far off. It happened May fourth, nineteen seventy. So what the shoot the Kent State the shooting. shooting. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Those yeah. are the days. Yeah. You know, but, it's you you used to turn on Dark Shadows to see horror and oppression and kidnapping, but it was the kind that made you feel better. Mm -hmm. yeah. it really, and now it's like, oh, oh, this horror just makes me feel bad. And it's yeah. true, there are those two different types of horror. Yeah. What did you guys think of Marie Wallace's character? She played a bunch of characters. She played Crazy Jenny. Uh, I love Megan Todd. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it, I, it is so refreshing to get to see, I mean, you know, I, I can't say Marie was having as much fun, right? but she's a good actor. And it was nice to see her just get to act yeah. and to hold the screen that way. Uh, and never has she been knock outier than as Megan Todd. Wow. What, mm -hmm. a, what a just gorgeous. And I, I, you know, I hate to reduce TV to this, but it is partly about glamour yeah. and about and about beauty and eros and things like that. And wow, that was just a Marie Wallace was just a a, a walking pillar of beauty. Yeah, it's actually good too that the show after you know kind of returned to its root, you know, turned to that that old idea of like dealing with the people in the town. And I think retrospectively, the Todds were maybe one of the most, the two of the most tragic people in the entire series. Yeah. Because they did nothing. You, know, you could argue, well, well, 
Jason, you know, Jason McGuire deserved what he got because he was a douchebag, you know. Um, You know, maybe Bill Malloy was doing the wrong thing. We don't know. But the Todd's did nothing wrong except open an antique shop. Yeah. You know, the. I, I'll let you finish that thought, and I, I have a thing about the Todd's one. Oh, no, that, that that's it. Yeah, they really didn't do anything. They didn't deserve their ultimate fate. So there is a cliche, you know, that's a good eye roller, and so I'll be the first to bring it up. And and that's the clueless woman who marries a man who clearly is not into her. And, you know... Philip Bernal uh, very much projects that. I'm, I, the uh, if, if if he were not gay, he certainly had all of the coded, you know, signifiers, the voice, the 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 cliched sort of stances, uh, the the exaggerated uh, 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 inflections and so on, that it's, it's whether he were or whether he weren't, it's, if you look up that stereotype in the dictionary, there he is. And so, you know, we think of that as, oh, oh, oh you know, we got an antique shop. Oh, 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 oh. And, um, and yet, the thing I love about that is that Philip Todd turns into a really determined hero. Yeah. And 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 what a way to take that cliche and completely turn it on its ear and say, well, maybe she did marry a guy who, you know, not not really her cup of tea or vice versa. And oh, okay, so, you know, she's the tall powerful one and now he'll be the willowy and effectual one. B.S. My friends, and I and and that's maybe a total accident. I don't think anyone would have had that conversation with him, but it's still part of the story in terms of just how we intrinsically relate to it. And I'm always surprised when I go back and watch this at how heroically dedicated and virile Philip Todd is towards trying to make this situation right. And so it's like take that stereotypes. Yeah, he does. He does do everything to try to right the ship for his character and for his wife. But unfortunately, it's just nothing. You know, seems to work for him. Unfortunately, what did you think, Gordon? Sorry. Yeah, I think I think the Todds are a really interesting couple um, because it's probably the the show's first time to actually do just like. Um, a realistic type of person within Collinwood, um, within Collinsport, rather. Um, you know, I think with with Chris Todd, I think it's it's ironic because, um, you know, uh, Jewel, you and I, I think had a conflict about how Chris Todd died, um, whether he jumped or was pushed, and basically he. You know, he was, he, was, he was going after Jeb and just Jeb just stepped to one side and he ran off the cliff. So we, we were both wrong. But um, but I do think there's something about the storyline where it's not a. I mean, Todd become Philip Todd becomes something of a hero the way that on some level Quentin does and on some level Barnabas later does. But I don't think this is a story where there's a clear. I think it's just the nature of the story. I mean, if you're doing a paranoid thriller, um, unless you have someone who absolutely knows the truth, um, it's hard to figure out, you know, um, and the fact that, that this episode suggests, well, some people are part Leviathan, some people are just kind of naturally susceptible, and that we don't know who what the Leviathan's true shape is, other than I think they all look like, um, you know, uh, Thayer David and Joker makeup, but uh, that's just me. Um, Back to the Eros. Yeah. But I, yeah, I don't think there's a clear cut. Um, I think this is an arc where there's no real kind of. I, you know, it's not that there are not good people and bad people. I just don't think one of them rises to the I'm going to strike back and, and be honest. And even. Um, 
Ooh, uh, uh, Jeffrey Scott's character, uh, Sky Sky Rumson. Sky Rumson. Yeah. You, you figure, okay, he 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 looks like a decent enough guy, but nope, he's one of the bad guys. Oh, and Angelique, works. who you'd figure, okay, she's going to be in cahoots with them. She's like, ah, screw it. I don't want to use my magic. And then it's like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll use my magic just this once. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's a question for you guys. What did you think of Jeb Hawks? I mean, I know he's not in this episode, but Christopher Pennock's character is really interesting. The way he portrays him is really good, whether he's being a heel or he's being a baby face. Uh, a lot of Christopher had a lot of talent, obviously, as did all the other Dark Shadows actors and actresses. But what did you guys think of his character? Uh, as a character, interesting. Yeah. Uh, his his turnaround is a little sudden, but it's nice to see. Because Chris Pennock's a nice guy, and he just projects that very easily, very effortlessly. Um, he is, I think, I think, you know, this is where the Monday morning quarterback really, you know, scores a touchdown, uh, because, um, he's a child Mm -hmm. and, and, and I wish they had really stuck with that and played it up more that, you know, the more he's out there, the less capable he is of anything, which is one of the things that makes Carolyn's relationship with him a little weird but she doesn't know that he's this you know man child kind of kind of figure so okay uh and i see why they thought he might be the great big bad but i also see why they backed away from that uh yeah yeah expectations Mm-hmm. Well, I also think, yeah, I also kind of to piggyback on Patrick's comments, Jeb's, Jeb Hawks is basically a god in, with the emotional capacity of the child. You know, he is he is the one that the Leithans have set up all this all this effort for. But because he grew up so so fast and didn't have the the appropriate, you know, even megalomaniacs have to grow up at some point. Um, he didn't have that, you know, for him. Like to me, his his turn at the end was kind of like, well, yeah. So what do you expect a kid to do? It's like, okay, well, I I want my way. I want my way. Oh, you know, he still wants his way. You know, he's the guy who said, okay, we need the book. No, you don't. Jim Pox is like, oh no, we don't need the book. We're going to do this my way. And there's no pushback from the Leviathans. No, like, hey, look, you know, we can't do that. Or <clears throat> the reason we use the book is we've seen every possible outcome, and this is the you know uh, best outcome. So his turn towards the end, to me, didn't surprise me because it's what a child would do versus what an adult would do. Yes. Yeah. Did I ever give you guys my theory that I think Christopher Pennock's character, Jeb Hawks, is the inspiration for Anakin Skywalker? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, I really... And, and, and if I can interrupt a bit, may have I ever told you about the the Klingon proverb that states that revenge is a dish best served cold, with pinto <laughs> beans and a nice Chianti. Very, very nice, very nice. I really enjoy what they do at first with the kid, making him heal. I mean, because he, like I said, he's taking over for Barnes. Jeb Hawks is the character of Jeb Hawks. Christopher Pennock plays very menacing. He plays a heel very correctly. There's, I love how arrogant and cocky he is. You're right. He is very much a immature child. And that's what he represents. Christopher Pennock does a really good job of representing Jeb Hawks as that in every way. He does a very good job of getting that across the audience. Again, this is, this is pre star Wars. This is pre Anakin Skywalker. And it, it, you know, when you get into the star Wars prequels, Anakin Skywalker is just this immature teen, you know, immature person who turns to the dark side because of his own insecurities and, and immaturities. And here you have Jeb Hawks, who is immature in of his decision making until he here's Carolyn, who's this drop dead, beautiful, gorgeous blonde woman who's 
come into who's more than come into her own maturity who know who knows what she wants and realizes hey i love jeb hawks and finally jeb's like okay this this woman cares about me and you have that realization I, it's a it's a really fun complex character that christopher pennock gets to play and watch really he's really fascinating to watch so um let me see is there anything you guys want to add about this episode or sorry what, what's your favorite scene i didn't get to ask that sorry i i just think seeing barnabas turned around for me yeah. seeing him go wait no 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 i'm not gonna do this what am i thinking and the idea of a ghost jail prisoner my ghost is prisoner to the liathans that's something straight off the national Enquirer. but that is one of the most philosophically intriguing ideas that the show had no reason to follow up because it was just a few words but gosh i wish big finish had explored that mm-hmm. gordon what's your favorite scene ah uh, let's see I think my favorite scene would be the. Um, uh, I th- I think it's it's where where Marsha Mason encounters him in the alley and she's like all, you know, hey, I, we should hang out and be friends. And Barnes is like, nope, nope, don't want to be friends. So, um, mostly because I think it's it's it it becomes very clear that she's basically set up to be a victim by the Leviathans. Oh, yeah. She is the frosted glass in this. You know, yeah. you see a guest star, they're not going to be around. Nah. I love how they go into the dream sequence in this episode The and out of it. Really well shot, well done. That's my favorite sequence and scene in this episode. Um, guys, is there anything you want to add about 915 before we go? It's your favorite sequence, Jewel, and you'll look great in the sequence. I have, I have, what are you guys doing tomorrow night, sir? Aging. What would you like us to do? Uh, I have a fun Dark Shadows episode for you guys, episode 240. Is there, is one for tomorrow night if you guys are uh, up for it? I will, I will show up and talk about 240. Yeah, we'll talk about 240. Okay, episode 240 tomorrow night, 10.30, uh, guys. Uh, link to Patrick McCray's Dark Shadows Day Book About is going to be in the description box. Link for Gordon Horowski's Amazon page is going to be in the description box. Gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your Saturday night. I'll see you tomorrow night. Sniff wisely. Bye-bye. Yep. See you tomorrow. <laughs>